Following the rusty railroad track, carrying his clothes in a paper sack. Just another broken heart to fix, said the poet of Motel 6. Following the rusty railroad track, give you the shirt right off his back. Just another memory to men, says the poet to his long lost friend. Some folks may not know it, but there goes the poet who played the guitar with only three fingers, but his words and his music and his memory linger. Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. The Lone Star Play Podcast is produced by TexasRealFood.com. Find out more at the end of this episode. Hi, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Super excited for today's episode. We have Kinky Friedman. It's a second time on the podcast, and this was my first time to cry on a podcast uh, because he played a beautiful song, and it brought me to tears, and I can't wait for you all to hear it. Uh, it's called The Poet of Motel 6, and it's based on a new album he has uh, coming out called The Poet of Motel 6. Uh, he hasn't recorded it yet. He's searching for, he's got all the songs written and he's searching for producers. So he goes into the backstory about that in the podcast. Please stay tuned. That's a, it's an amazing podcast. Um, and yeah, super excited for y'all to hear that song. It's an exclusive. He hadn't played it for anybody. He hadn't played it in public. I was blown away. Okay. So it's an exclusive here on the Lone Star Plate from Kinky Friedman. Um, He's also uh, uh, got a, um, an album out right now, okay? It's called Live Down Under. It's uh, presented by Omnivore Recordings. It's with Kinky and Billy Joe Schaefer. And it's basically uh, a, a concert that they had about 20 years ago in Australia. And now they released the album of that concert, right? And the backstory of how that concert actually happened in Australia is absolutely amazing. And Kinky goes into that, into this podcast. It's awesome, okay? The, 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 not everything that happened, but the, the way he tells it in the story is, is awesome. Um, some of the stuff is tragic, but, you know, looking back and everything, um, just a real pl pleasure to, to hear some of these, you know, stories and find out these details. It just makes it all the more fascinating. So... Link in the description. You can get that album now live down under with uh, Kinky Friedman and Billy Joe Shape. Um, also, he gave his opinion on the governor race, what's happening with Matthew McConaughey. Here are his opinion on that. Fascinating. With Kinky, you never know what you're going to get. And I love that, man. He's always got sayings and stories and and he's just, uh, you just never know what you're going to get. So that's awesome about him. And, you know, there's one thing um, we actually didn't get a chance to. We just started talking and next thing you know, an hour had passed and it was the interview was over. So um he's got a special project for gold star uh families it's a camp for kids at echo hill um and we'll put a link in the description it's echo hill uh dot org but basically um next summer he's going to have one session devoted to afghan refugee children so that's pretty cool um this is what kinky does man he helps people that that's the thing kinky gets a bad rap i think sometimes of his opinions and this and that but the truth is the guy is super nice genuine um great person to know you know honest just wants to help people really re really 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 uh love talking to kinky probably you know these these gosh man these are probably like some of my favorite interviews for real definitely absolutely you know he's a legend it's an honor to do him so yeah. Um, so check that out. All the links in the description. Super excited for y'all to hear it. Uh, look, Kinky Friedman on the Lone Star Plate podcast is coming up. But as always, guys, look, we have to get a word from our sponsor, Texas Real Food. OK, we got to keep the mics on. We'll use Facebook, y'all. So I wouldn't even bother. But please check us out on Instagram and our new TikTok. That's right. We're on TikTok and we are. Man, we're growing strong on TikTok. Super happy about it. Please check us out. The Lone Star Plate 
Um, and uh, on YouTube, if you're if you're watching, if you're listening uh, on YouTube, uh, and people do listen on YouTube, they don't just watch it. Please hit the uh, subscribe button or just hit the like on a video or something. It really helps us out or share it or something or leave a comment. We get a lot of engagement, so thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Um, let's get to this interview. What do y'all say? Kinky Friedman on the Lone Star Plate podcast, singing a special song, The Poet of Motel 6, Never Before Heard. Enjoy. <laughs> Okay, well let's let's yeah let's jump into this. Kinky, thank you so much, man, for for joining us. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am uh, to talk to you again. I've been thinking about it since we set it up, to be honest with you. So I'm really really excited. As I was saying uh, earlier, uh, just off camera and everything to you, it's incredible that you and I are still alive and well, <laughs> relatively well. Yes, and it's these are uh, really really crazy times. They are. And I, I would just recommend to people, if they want, if longevity is what you want, be a little more of an asshole. That's my advice. Because <laughs> the really good people and the kind-hearted, nice people, are, are they're dropping like flies. And the people, that are, you know, the lawyers, the, the, the ones that are you know, the, the sleazy kind of people that are ethically challenged, those people are doing just fine. So you don't have to turn into a complete jerk, but just be a little more of an asshole with my advice. Practice it and get it down. Love this. Just and a little I'll, edge, right? A little edge. Yeah, that's right. You got that, and uh, you'll do much. You'll you'll live longer if that's your goal. Okay, I love that. That's definitely my goal. Not to live too long. I don't know. Have you ever have you ever thought about that, Kinky? Like living that thought of living forever. How does that sound to you? That idea of you know, living forever. Yeah, that would be just a, a nightmare. <laughs> Unless you moved in uh, next to a, uh, what was that place we used to live in, Dylan? The, the, uh, Leslie, Leslie, what? In Kuching, I mean? No, no, in Hawaii. The lesbian. Uh, oh! What is it? You mean, oh, the leprosarium for unwed mothers, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, the <laughs> leprosarium for unwed mothers. <laughs> We used to hang out a lot, but uh, now we're uh, now now I've got one goal in life, and that is to pick a producer for this record, uh, the poet of Motel Six, and the record is ready to go, and the producers that I've selected, and that like me and I like them, are uh, one of them's in L.A., one's in Texas, and one's in New York. <laughs> now we're going to winnow that down. Oh, so you got to pick one of the three, obviously, right? That's, yeah. yeah. One that doesn't exactly. charge a million bucks and yeah. <laughs> says he loves kinky. <laughs> I'm sure you've got that. Well, Come they on. all well, seem to, down to kinky, three. You know, for the, all the good it's done. Yeah. You know what? Maybe you maybe you give uh, in the kitchen world. Yeah, I'm a chef. What we do is uh, if you have like, let's say I had three line cooks I was trying to pick for a sous chef, I'd give them the same dish and say, cook it for me. Uh, maybe you give them each a song and say, let me, you know, let's see what you do with this. I don't know. I, listen, Kiki. That's don't a very good me. idea. And you could say whatever I like and see, like, I would like a, a, a big hairy steak. <laughs> I think I told you last time, but that <laughs> is an important dish and goes very underrated. I mean, an ability to, to cook a big hairy steak. Absolutely. Well, there's a lot of myths about cooking steaks. First of all, the people still you know, give into that, that, you know, don't exist. So they have a hard time cooking their steak because they're still going off of information that's, uh, uh, that's old. Well, we won't get into all that, but let's talk well, about this. Uh, oh no, go ahead. Kinky. Sorry. Well, you go ahead. Cause I have less to talk about. <laughs> Actually, the truth is we have a lot to talk about, but when you start talking about it, you know, everybody kind of goes into a diabetic coma, you know. Right. Well, but we'll we should probably exciting. mention, you know, we should mention a couple of things. One, yes. um, the uh, Live Down Under uh, CD has just come out. Yes. And it is, uh, it's the first record that I've ever been involved with that has no negative comment yet. I That's mean, awesome. Now, it'll get slammed now, but what I'm saying is <laughs> it's uh, did it no, not even usually they'll put one line in to show that they can be a little snarky, you know. Yeah. But that hasn't happened yet. So and what that is, what that record is, is me and Billy Joe Shaver in Australia 
uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Yeah. And that was right after uh, Billy's kid died. And I think his wife died. And it was just, uh, he was, and the doctors all told him, don't go with Kinky Dog Australia. And I very wisely encouraged him to get the hell out of his current scene and come with me to Australia. And Billy Joe was sure that he didn't have any fans down there. He'd never been there and so forth. And it was fun watching the, the nightclub from the front as the fans were coming in. And you could see who was for Billy Joe and who was for Kinky. <laughs> Kinky crowd was pretty slick by Australian standards. And um, and Billy Joe's crowd, I mean, they were driving buckboards and whatever. <laughs> Some of them had come up. 700, 600 miles had driven wow. that far to see Billy Joe Shaver. Wow. And, and uh, of course, it was a magnificent show. And um, anybody who saw that one uh, didn't miss out. And I guess I'll get rid of my, these are sunglasses cost $10. Great deal. And yeah, but yeah, I bought them in uh, Medina, Texas. I know Medina, yeah. little little uh, convenience store stop. Is that yeah. what that is? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I Who hasn't done that in Texas, right? <laughs> no. So I'm um, on the same plane flight, uh, going out to LA to check out the producer. I met a guy, and. Uh, I told him on the plane, I told him, I can't believe it. I'm 74 years old. And the guy said, well, my dad is 74 and he's wearing a bikini. <laughs> that remark was interesting enough to make me want to continue the conversation. He <laughs> did, and I came to find out what it was that he'd actually said. And what he'd actually said is, my dad has just turned 74 and he's moving to McKinney. No, that's it's not a joke. It's a real life incident. Yeah. He's to McKinney, and you thought bikini, but that yeah, I was yeah. thinking bikini. But yeah, hey, it happens. McKinney, bikini. No, I'm going to get hearing aids right after this show because I've just kind of got to guess what you're saying. I'm oh good. gosh, I'm sorry. Do I need to speak louder? Held, Is that the deal? I could be held with a hearing aids. Yeah, then I would really hear what people are saying. My but wife the, can't understand me either. Don't worry, Kinky. Well, you, you know, you learn to tune out stuff in life anyway, most of it. Yeah. And what did, uh, did Dennis Hopper say? That you can learn more by talking than you can by listening. <laughs> I love that. I've always heard it the other way, but uh, I'll tell you. Very wise thing. Uh, yeah. You can learn a lot about a man or a woman just uh, from talking to them and seeing what their reaction is. Oh, can. I see. I yeah. see. Same like reaction. Yeah, yeah. Because anybody can do a good interview these days. You try hiring somebody, and the guy will come, or gal will become completely unwrapped after about the second week. And, you, you know, and they did a great interview. Yeah. Very good. Uh, yeah. Kinky, I want to talk more about this uh, concert, this Live Down Under, man. Um, uh, you know, I'm so what I'm curious about is because uh, I read this other story, kind of what you said, but I guess it was a little more to it. Like Billy Joe was was going to have he had had a heart attack and they were going to do surgery. And you and Willie, you know, told him, hey, you need some R&R. &R. You know, you, you need to come down here. He, he definitely did. I mean, he he was half traumatized when we got, you know, and he was all worried about. And that's not like Billy Joe anyway. He just sure. But when we saw the uh, buckboard start rolling in and the uh, old old model cars and things like that, we knew that his fans were there. And uh, so and he it was, was happy. We also had uh, Jesse Guitar Davis. Is that right, Dave. Dylan? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, Washington uh, Rasso. And and uh, little Juford, a uh, little Juford. Um, yeah, I saw a picture you put up today on your uh, Instagram, actually, with him. 
he, he's a Jew and he drives a Ford, basically. <laughs> but uh, but this this was a uh, this is a very interesting tour, and uh, and Billy Joe was really happy that, that he, he went. Yeah, because I was kind of playing with shrimp in this thing. That I had a lot on the line to bring him out there. I mean, it does. It's nothing that the doctors wanted at all. I mean, they were vehement about don't go out there to Australia where Kinky is the last thing you need to do. And um, well, Billy Joe is the the focus of the record that I've just completed, um, the poet of Motel Six. And um, if we can find a way to play it, let's do. But if it requires too many things to move around, okay. But this would be then the first performance of this. Oh, what? Yeah, okay, be, let's make that happen. Of the song. Wow, that would be amazing. So that, gonna... That's up to you, Patrick. You don't have, don't have to do it. We can do it. What? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, well, Floyd is ready here, so. Mm -hmm. You need to get your... I don't know if I'm ready. Let's see. Yeah, I'll probably move this a little bit. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Well, I look you, at it, you. it kills, kills another three minutes of bullshit. But, you know. <laughs> this is the opposite of bullshit, actually. I forgot how much I laugh uh, when we talk, Kinky. You really, uh, you have such a great sense of humor, man. I got to tell you, that's such a phenomenal thing. Well, that that thing we did with. Um, the, the story of uh, Willie Nelson calling me in the middle of the night. Did we do that? Did we? Because that was now a couple of years ago. Oh, man. I, I'll be well, honest. I, I don't remember. Story. I can bring it in in at least an hour and a half. No, I can do it very quickly. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there was one night that I was here alone at the ranch uh, watching Matlock. Great show. And uh, three, three o'clock. It was a great show. A very great show. And it was three o'clock in the morning and I'm watching it. So the phone rings, and the voice says, uh, a voice I can't quite hear, partly because I need hearing aids, and partly because it speaks in a soft tone. And uh, so I said, who is this? And he said, it's red. And I said, who? Who's calling? And he said, it's Willie Nelson. He said, you remember me on the road again. <laughs> and anyway, so... Um, Willie said, uh, what are you doing, Kink? And I said, well, I'm watching Matlock. And he said, that's a sure sign of depression. <laughs> and um, he said, "Take, turn Matlock off, Kink. Turn Matlock off and start writing, man. Start writing. So this is, I guess, the first guy that encouraged me to write again in many years. Wow. Many years. And it inspired me, sort of. And I wrote about... 15 or 20 songs in a short period of time. And I called Willie and said, I'm, Willie, I've been writing now like a fiend, and like Oscar Wilde with his hair on fire in Britain. And I've got about 12 or 15 songs. And uh, Willie says, well, send them to me, send them on. And I said, Willie, I've been hearing all these rumors that, uh, that you're not well, that you're, you know, um, is everything uh, going okay? And uh, Willie says, uh, well, you know, it's a little up and a little down, the usual. By the way, Kinky, what channel is Matt Lockett on? <laughs> so uh, that was that story. Yeah. <laughs> that one is word for word true. That's just what he said. What channel is Matt Lockett on? <laughs> That's a great one. Uh, he, was so, to, he was ready to get down on Matt Lock. Um, Love it. All right, this is uh, the poet of Motel Six, as best as we can get it. Wow. All right. Following the rusty railroad track, carrying his clothes in a paper sack, just another broken heart to fix said the poet of Motel 6. Following the rusty railroad track, 
give you the shirt right off his back. Just another memory to men, says the poet to his long lost friend. Some folks may not know it, but there goes the poet who played the guitar with only three fingers, but his words and his music and his memory lingered. He'd stay up all night, he would drink and he would fight. Ah, but every song he'd write was the story of our lives. Some folks may not know it, but there goes the poet who played and sang and loved with all his mighty heart. Till it just, till it just broke apart. And may you lay in a field of stars, serenaded by a million guitars, playing songs of your honky tonk youth. Playing songs of your beautiful truth. Following the rusty railroad track, carrying his clothes in a paper sack. Just another broken heart to fix, said the poet of Motel 6. Following the rusty railroad track, give you the shirt right off his back. Just another memory to men, says the poet to his long lost friend. And then one uncloudy day, God's voice was heard across the heavens. And this is what he said. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Billy Joe Shaver. Getting it down, getting it down. Wow. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I shed a few tears here, Kinky. I apologize. Well, you're a very sensitive man, Patrick. I can see that. I really am, actually. Uh, I, I didn't expect that to happen. I'm not going to lie. I just started thinking about my father. He passed away about five years ago. And <laughs> wow. I don't even have anything. I, uh, you know, this has never happened to me on a podcast before, to be honest with you. Uh, well, it's very revealing and it tells you. Oh, oh man that's a great song kinky well thank you very much we appreciate it and well it is it's it's i don't know if it is or not it's a heartfelt thing and oh man yes no that wow <laughs> this is what music this is what music does right this is what music does to people oh yeah I, frankly there's only been about eight people that have heard it that have played it before all wow. of them all of them have cried, and uh, wow. the men are more sensitive than the women. <laughs> you want to play crying, as, and the men, particularly, used to be that a Rodham Jew boy would uh, make the Christians cry, and the Jews would be, hey, is that anti-Semitic? Are we doing something that we shouldn't be doing? Because they didn't know what the song was even about. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know what else to say. I guess that that's why you do music, right? Is to inspire people and to motivate them and to, I don't know, push them emotionally, I guess, uh, challenge them emotionally. Um, I mean, I'm still thinking about that song, Kinky. It's such a beautiful... Well, it's... Uh, a, oh my God, I can't wait for this album to come out. Yeah, there's going to be a good one. I just have to see if I want the producer from New York <laughs> or whoever's gonna make these songs sound like what you just played these whoever's not gonna take that spirit away yeah you know? we just need a guy who can deliver that song yes not screwing it up you know, can exactly it. no no absolutely in fact that version was pretty good why don't we use that one 
Yeah, if it's okay, can you please send us a, if it's uh, okay with okay. Patrick, why don't we get get the producers to see if they understand? Absolutely, uh, I'll say everything goes to the editors today, so I'll have them turn that around quickly. At least the song, well, especially, uh, no problem. Well, absolutely, then you, then you don't mind that. We're just using it to give to these producers. Yes, of course. Uh, I honestly, I'll do it myself today because it'll take a little while for the editors to get it back. So I, I can I can separate that song myself for, for you all. hundred percent. Are you kidding me? I remember uh, the first time Willie produced a record for me, which you never want Willie or Bob Dylan or somebody to produce for you because it minimalizes everybody else. Just, um, and Warren genius, Warren Zevon was a genius, and he had. But he would often use those famous guys as crutches, you know. I mean, that, that doesn't help. And um, like the three that I have, or three of the ones who you would recognize their name, I wanted Phil Spector, if I could get him. But apparently, he's, 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 he's not like, around, right? He's, they know who they are. He's, and, uh, and we'd see, is that important that they that knocked out? I mean, that song knocked your dick to your watch pocket, as we say in Nashville. <laughs> um, and still, it uh, it works. <laughs> the damn song works. So, wow. oh, I never I never heard that saying before, Kiki. I thought I heard it all. Well, we're all learning a lot. In this <laughs> oh, man. Uh -huh. oh my god. Oh geez. Well, anyway, okay. Dylan Dylan Quatorius Ferrero <laughs> was our campaign, and not our campaign. He would, would have been a terrible campaign manager, but he was a great tour manager. <laughs> and uh, and with the shoe boys, he had a hell of a. These guys did not get along with each other. Um, they would just leave anytime they wanted to, and come back when they wanted to. And uh, but we also had a lot of. Um, Jerry Garcia type people, uh, Ken Kesey coming by, and a lot, of course, famous musicians, and that made the thing really fun for us. Yeah, of course. And, um, Absolutely. I don't know if I told you about the uh, the time this guy came into the uh, studio, not studio, into the Troubadour. Okay. In, uh, LA. And uh, I was at the bar, and uh, a guy comes in dressed cowboy style, and I said, this, this guy is one of those Texas cowboy songwriters, but I don't know which one. I've been out of the loop till I've been on with, with Bob Dylan on the Rolling Thunder thing. So I didn't know who he was, and he knew who I was. He came and sat down next to me. He said, okay, sir, how you doing, mate? Let me buy, buy you a round. He bought me a, about 10 rounds, and, um, and I still didn't know who he was. And we, we, he invited me into the men's room where he had some Peruvian marching powder. And, uh, I, after half an hour talking to the guy, I was faking it, you know, that he was, you know, he was somebody I knew. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have a clue who the guy was. And so finally I felt it was the only honest thing to do is to ask him. So I said, look, pal, I hate to do this, but what is your name? <laughs> he said, Eric Clapton. And that was how I met Eric Clapton. Holy shit. He, there, he was performing. Old Ben Lucas had a lot of mucus, which was my first song I wrote when I was about nine. He was playing it on Sly Dobro. And um, I learned one lesson from that, from the Eric Clapton. He's a wonderful guy. And we're a big, huge talent. But um, he, he'll say hello to everybody. The guy that was mopping up the floor, uh, I introduced him to, this was out at Shangri-La, the band studio. And uh, I mean, really, these rock stars usually don't want to meet anybody. So, but Eric was very different from that. And finally, at the end, I introduced him to the, the uh, president of Epic Records. Oh, wow. And Clapton. And Clapton would not shake hands with a guy. Piss off. Piss off, mate. That's what he said. <laughs> Shows you he had nothing personal against the guy, but anybody who's president of a record company, he doesn't want to know. Sure. And I learned a lot from that experience. 
you know, it's, it's nice to see a guy that's that kind hearted, but that does not, will not shake hands with a record company. In a second. Sure. Well, I know what he's talking about. You know, yeah. Absolutely. Not that he's screwed by anybody, but all the good people did. Wow. Wow. What a story, Kinky. Holy cow. Oh, that's amazing. You, you know what I just saw you in Kinky? Uh, not to change something. I'm so sorry. I just want to forget this, but I was watching just I'm randomly. Yeah, anyway, what? No, but randomly, I was watching this show on YouTube. I'm a big Christopher Hitchens fan. So I was oh, watching yeah. this documentary on Christopher Hitchens. He came to Texas. You were in it. He was on a ranch right there. That's yeah. Right. He, he, that he came, you know, yeah, you were in it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love Christopher Hitchens. What What is he like in person? I mean, well, obviously, he's, he's passed away, of course. Uh, well, it's easy to call people geniuses, but, uh, you know, Warren Zevon and Christopher Hitchens are two of them. Van Dyke Parks is another one. And most of them, once they start calling you a genius, you're in trouble, you know? <laughs> That's the way Hollywood works. Sure. Absolutely. So, Goes to your head. So I'm trying to uh, be a little more of an asshole and take my own advice. And uh, so far, it's working well. <laughs> so Hitchens came to the ranch. You spoke to him. Did, I mean, obviously. So you were a fan of his before he... He showed yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, he was, he was a real, he would take a drink, you know, but yeah. But there's a lot of guys that are piss artists, you know, who don't have Christopher Hitchens' talent. That's amazing. Oh, I loved seeing it. I, I just was a, you know, a nice uh, a surprise watching the uh, yeah, this, this documentary. Yeah, this, show, this show is beginning to cover some range and uh, philosophical uh, aspects. And, how would you like to be in a room with Warren Zevon, Dennis Hopper, and Christopher Hitchens? I I would do anything. Not to, to mention you, or me, you know. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I, I just don't even <laughs> imagine. I, I couldn't even imagine, uh, to be honest with you. Um, you know what else I was going to ask you, um, Kinky? There's um, been a lot of people in the news lately who want to try to run for governor. Given your history, I was curious what your opinion was of like you know Matthew McConaughey wanting to run for governorship but what do you think of that idea well it's an easy easy, easy gig it's not difficult <laughs> you just have to run at the right time and i ran at the wrong time i mean i ran when when people were just beginning to call people racist and i remember it really struck me hard and i would try to knock it down quick with the media and I, well you're talking to the only guy in the race that was in the peace corps and, and, you know, I've worked and lived with, with native tribes in Borneo, and you're calling me a racist. And I mean, it really stung me. And, and, Absolutely. Uh, that, uh, then uh, what Lyle did was he recited the lyrics to Nashville Casualty in Life, which is a song I wrote about a black blues artist who's in the rain, you know, and is life is nothing and it's a Nashville casualty and life goes on and Lyle said the guy that could write that song is not a racist and uh, anyway so with the, they got I me agree. as they like to say off off message sure so here I am telling what a wonderful guy I am you know and all that and really, what, do, no. what, do we, what do we say about the uh, the Crips and the Bloods are the Democrats and the Republicans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. They might get you if you try to run as an independent, and then they got me. Yeah, that's the thing, right? This two-party system of, uh, no. you know, it well, it's stinks. Still, it's, all, it's now all politics. Yeah. As I always like to say, poly means more than one, and ticks are blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> <laughs> what were we discussing before that subject? No, I was asking you what you thought of Matthew McConaughey running for. Oh, well, I like somebody that. you would you like him? He'd be he'd be a much better governor than uh, the ones we we've, we've recently had. I agree with that. I would vote for him to be honest with you. And uh, if a guy like McConaughey or Kinky was ever elected, uh, things would be different. And, I agree. Uh, and we could do a lot. We would instantly convert this state to the hippest state in the union by far. Because <laughs> it is a pretty hip state. I agree. But, you know, 
but it won't be if it continues to have the kind of politicians that it does. Yep. They're, they're pretty, pretty pathetic. We're always in the news for the wrong reasons. Uh, Texas, right? You just see Texas and you're like, oh, what, what's it about? Oh, okay. Something stupid, right? You're just, uh, ugh, this, it drives me nuts. I'm constantly defending Texas to, you know, my friends and family that live outside of Texas. Well, they're, yeah, they're ignorant and they're, I mean, who wouldn't want to be from Texas when you think about it? Because I agree. We all grew up that way, right? With little cowboy uh, outfits and whatever the hell we wore. I'm with you. I love Texas. Um, I've moved away several times, but I've always found my way back here. You know? Well, when you, you know, L.A. is like a kind of a wasteland. I mean, compared to Texas, Texas is a real thing. Absolutely. Texas is, is, is my home state, always will be, and, and I love it for sure. I love that you're such a voice for Texas, Kinky. I mean that. You really are. You're, you're a very powerful voice uh, for Texas. Texas has some interesting people in it. It really does. You know. Who's your favorite Texan? Is that a weird question? Who's your favorite Texan? Well, they'd be dead. I mean, yeah, uh, that's okay. Well, Sam Houston, I've always liked very much because he's the guy who invented Texas. Yeah. He had 12 people there at his funeral, I think. Oh, wow. He, well, when he first, when he campaigned for governor, which he did, people threw tomatoes and rocks at him and all that. So, you know, that's part of the course. And, um, Sam, Sam Houston was once asked, uh, "What's the most important job you held?" Because he'd been everything. He was eventually elected governor, and he was elected senator, and he was elected everything you could think of, and he had done it all. And and they asked him which honor you had it was was which career move did you make that you felt was the biggest honor. And he yeah. said, that, that's easy. He said, teacher, because I built my first one room schoolhouse myself. And uh, I was a teacher there for four years. He was in Kentucky, or was in, a little bit in Tennessee. I don't know. He was a teacher. And wow. that he was also a general in the, in the army. And, um, was he president of Texas when Texas was its own? I think he was. I think it almost was nothing, Sammy. They didn't go to Sam every time they had a problem. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's just the go-to guy, that's right? Where, uh, that's where the uh, the Yellow Rose of Texas came from. Uh, and she was um, half Mexican and half white, which was a big deal back then. And... Um, her name was, that one might be worth Googling, but, uh, or whatever you do with it, but, but her name was, um, but anyway, she, she's the one who occupied uh, um, the general, the general at the Alamo that killed all the Texans. Uh, yeah. That's it. Your mind is still working, though. I'm sure good. <laughs> was occupied sexually with she's not well known but she should be you know the I'm, gonna go Texas. I'm gonna google it because i could fill it some of the oh man it's not giving a name i got a song by elvis presley uh <laughs> it just keeps bringing up a song here well at any rate that's about yeah. part of the course that's all right she occupied Sam Houston for 48 hours sexually. When a 12 year old boy, she sent a messenger to tell Sam Houston that uh, Santa, Santa Anna, that's a racetrack. Yeah. That Santa Anna was uh, sleeping in her house and it looked like he would be out for, you have about six hours or you have to, to move in, you know. Because all of his troops sent out and had them sleep outside of the fields, you know. He himself was in his house. So he's not given any any commands to attack or anything. And sure enough, uh, they captured the entire Mexican army that was uh, and and the entire Polish army. No, that's a joke. Anyway, <laughs> the entire Mexican army. They captured the whole army. 
And everybody wanted Santa Ana's head. They all wanted to kill him because he killed everybody at the Alamo. Yeah. And and um, Santa uh, Sam Houston would not let them do it. And everybody thought it was nuts. He wouldn't let them kill any Mexican soldier. He just took them, captured all of them, surrounded them. And because of that, he showed what a what a man he was, what a Christian he was. Yeah. Um, everybody was bowled away by it, and that was the end of the battle, the end of the war, in fact. And that's when Texas really started to rock. Wow. I didn't know that. I, I had no idea about that. About the hell is a woman's name. She's a very pretty woman. This was years ago. Long, long I can't believe Google's not bringing it up. It's just bringing up this song by Elvis. Well, all it gives you is music, right? Uh, yeah, but it does. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. I think I found it. I'll try to fill some dead air here if we can. Yeah, there you go. Um, uh, yeah, the Yellow Rose, her role yeah. in, the, in the defeat of Santa Ana's forces, just like you said, uh, at San Jacinto. Well, what was her name? There's a hotel name. Oh, uh, Emily West. Yeah, Emily. Emily West? And Emily the, West. I get the name right, but it was Emily who was, and That's it wasn't it Dickinson, we know that. But yeah, <laughs> those, are the, those are the two Emily's. That's it, Emily West. Yep. Well, we're how are we doing? Uh, we're we're doing good. Uh, Keegan, let me see here. Uh, yeah, look, I have one more question for you before we. Th this will be the the this can't possibly go on anymore. I've given given and given so much. You've given so much, Kinky. I promise you're going to want to answer this question. This will be the last the last thing I had to ask because uh, I've been asking every songwriter this lately. Um, I, I'm curious, and if you may not know, but is there a song in your catalog that you're most proud of? At the moment, the one that you heard, the the poet of Motel yeah, said, "That's it right now." And people, people love the title, so it's good starting with that. Amazing title, it really is. But the song itself is a pretty accurate portrayal of Billy Joe Shaver, who is. In, in modern times, like Willie says, he's the greatest songwriter we've got. And that includes Willie and a lot of these guys who have written thousands of songs, and many of them are great. But uh, Billy Joe, every line is pure poetry. And he lives lived the part. No, that's amazing. That's, you know, what an honor. Um, absolutely. And I'm sure for him to know you as well, Kinky, right? It sounds like just a great friendship. Yeah. I love uh, that. That's awesome. He's one for sure. I think uh, Waylon Jennings' lifestyle precluded him from, but still, Hoss, Hoss, are you awake? Hello. <laughs> uh, Waylon <laughs> called over buddy Hoss. And Bill and I are trying to bring it back. It's a great word. Now nobody calls anybody Hoss. But I love Hoss. Big Hoss, small Hoss. Hoss, 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 wait a minute. Uh, that's, Absolutely. And it's I grew a, up with Hoss. I grew up with the Hoss. I, I know, I know all about that. Yeah. We used to well, say, we, I we, still we, say it. We want to bring back, bring back Hoss. Bring back Hoss. I'm with you, Kinky. I'll, I'll okay, join he, in on it. And at one time he used it very successfully was when uh, Willie, but at this time, the president of Columbia Records was uh, just furious. He was upset with the, what Willie had sent them. Willie is the first production that he ever made. And uh, I think it cost $20,000, which they thought was nothing. He didn't spend that up. Did it all in four days. And his dog can be heard barking in the background of most of the, uh, the <laughs> early tracks. But uh, howling in the background. But, uh, but it was just... It required Waylon Jennings to fly to New York and then jump up on this guy's desk and tell him what a schmuck he was. That it was missing one of the greatest songs ever written right here. And Willie's version of it is sensational. And you guys are just, you know, you're saying it's a novelty record, it's a joke. And everybody at the record company missed it. I mean, they, nobody saw that this could be, be something. In fact, they brought their whole staff from Nashville to try to fix this with strings and horns and whatever. They, and they all said, this is bad. It's a bad demo. 
Sounds like a bad demo. Wow. Anyway, enough about that. But Willie has certainly been through the mill. That that song, of course, as we all know, is just a joy to hear. It's really it's a beautiful thing. Almost like the time Willie was arrested on, on the border and was standing there in the night. That was one that I'm very happy I saw with my own eyes. And they put handcuffs on him. And then they started wanting autographs with and Willie <laughs> signed. Wow. With autographs, handcuffed outside of McAllen, Texas. Wow. Oh, man. Funny world. Wow, that's crazy. With the handcuffs on. Well, let's all move. To Unbelievable. Want to move to McKinney? <laughs> that is really a good. The, the other one, Wookie, if we still have time. Uh, Willie plays golf and loves to do it. I, the only two good balls I ever hit was when I stepped on the garden rake. But. Uh, <laughs> I find it stultifyingly dull. Last time I was on the course, there this woman came running up and saying, uh, I've been stung by a bee. And the golf pro asked her, where did it sting her? And she said, between the first and second holes. And the golf pro said, well, I can tell you right now, your stance is too wide. <laughs> <laughs> Rush that one a little bit. The time it is. <laughs> that was a good joke. I mean, it's not Patrick laughing. So I'm looking at him, and he's listening. I can see him looking at me like uh, this guy is really fucked up. With pity in his eyes, Patrick is looking at me. He is. Look at the, look at the place in there. You know, he, he's not laughing now. I did it anyway. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Patrick. And no, thank you so much, Kinky. This, this has been absolutely amazing. I, I got to tell you, and thank you so much for the song. Glad you like the song. That's good that every that's songwriter likes to have a little spiritual support once in a while. That's awesome. And and again, we'll we'll hundred percent. I'll I'll get this song over to you guys so you can you know send it off or do whatever you need to. And and thank you so much for for doing that, Kinky. That's a real um, treat treat for us and our podcast and. I just thank you so much, man. You're just such a great person, and I really enjoy having you on and talking to you, and uh, you're genuine, and that's something I, I respect a lot. Thank you, and we'll see you down the highway. Man. I hope so, Kinky. Thank you so much. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com, and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time. <laughs>